uh, I'd like to talk to you today about distributed column stores and why we built one. So, so um, my name is Sam Stokes, and I'm a, a boxer and a land conservationist, and um, uh, also I'm an engineer at a small startup called Honeycomb in San Francisco. And when I'm not making software, I'm usually found making cocktails or sometimes bad jokes. And I'd like you to meet Retriever. What is Retriever? Well, Retriever is a distributed column store. It's also an analytic query engine, and we have a schemaless data model, and hang on. Let's back up a bit, because you're probably wondering, like, why would someone build a database? It's pretty much rule number one, right, of any company is that you don't build your own database. Uh, and if you do, you don't call it a database, you call it a data store. So we built a data store, big difference. Okay, so Retriever is a domain-specific data store. It's kind of like, you know, domain-specific language. No one should build their own language either. But sometimes there are particular domains where it's useful to build some abstractions and provide yourself with some tools. So to talk about Retriever being a domain-specific data store, I have to talk a bit about the reason that we built it. We built it to power Honeycomb. So let me talk a bit about Honeycomb. Well, you can think of Honeycomb, this is the company I work for, as a debugger for production. And that's a bit vague. We want to help engineers understand and troubleshoot distributed systems, which, as you may be aware, can be kind of difficult to understand at times. Um, and Honeycomb sits in between metrics and traditional log aggregation tools, but that's a bit abstract. So let me make it a bit more concrete by talking about how Honeycomb works. So the basic idea is that your systems, the ones you want to understand better, they send us events. Events are otherwise known as structured logs. They're otherwise known as blobs of JSON. Uh, here's an example event. Uh, you can see it's got a bunch of different fields, you know, like an endpoint and a host name and a status code. This is an event representing the processing of an HTTP request. So you send us lots of these things. We store them. We just store all the events that we get in a way that lets us get them back later. You issue queries in a kind of database-like way. Uh, so here we're saying, like, for every endpoint in events that I'm sending in, calculate with these two things, like response time and some other thing. And we turn your queries into pretty graphs like this. And there's a lot going on in this graph. So don't worry too much. This isn't a talk about data visualization. Uh, but suffice to say that if any of you are fans of heat maps for visualizing response time distributions, then uh, come talk to me afterwards, because I get really excited about it. But let's give an example of how you might use something like this, just to make it a bit clearer what problem we're trying to solve here. So let's say you run an app, a web app, and one of your users sends you an email saying, hey, I tried to use your app last night. I tried to upload a cat picture, and it didn't work. And you're like, great, it didn't work. What exactly does that mean? Like, users never tell you what's actually wrong. So you need to go and find out what happened. So you ask us to draw a graph of errors over time. So here are, you know, here's a graph of error rate. And you see, OK, right, well, there was an error spike you know, around 2.30 a.m., that's about the time that the user sent their email. So I guess, you know, we've confirmed there was a problem. Great, but why? Like, what happened? Things were fine and then they suddenly weren't. So the first thing you might think is, you know, we've been doing this a while. When things go wrong, it's usually Amazon's fault. So Maybe one availability zone went down or something. You know, we're hosted, we're doing best practices, we're hosted across two AZs. So let's break down this graph by availability zone in order to see if there's any pattern there. And so we do that, and we get this graph, and now we've got you know, two lines, one for each zone. But we straight away see that, well, this spike was correlated in both zones. It happened at the same time, about the same magnitude, so what is going on is not specific to one zone. It's just going on across the board. So green tick, everything's fine, but we haven't solved the problem. So we need to dig deeper 
So let's actually look at the events that we use to generate this graph. These are the events that your application is sending us. So again, we store all the events. So you might go in and you'd say, well, find me all the, all the events that showed an error. So we see they have all, um, can't see where my point is going. Um, yeah, we can see they all have an error status code, like 500. Um, they seem to be coming from a bunch of different host names, so there's no real clue there. But they do all seem to share this one build ID in common. You know, let's say that's the, the build version of the software that we're running. So, you know, we haven't proved anything yet, but maybe there's something wrong with that build that is causing this error. So let's go back to the graph and try breaking down by build ID. Well, this shows pretty obviously that the spike is coming from this new build that we rolled out, and maybe we noticed and rolled it back, or you know, maybe it rolled itself back or something. But now we know pretty much where the problem is. You know, we still don't know what it is because I haven't talked about the details of this hypothetical software, but you know, we can go check out this new build, see what changed, uh, fix the bug, et cetera. We might have one more question, which is like, how many people did this affect? How bad was this? You know, was it just one user that was unlucky? So we can ask one more question. Tell me all of the distinct host names in my cluster grouped by build ID. So in other words, how many servers did each build exist on? And so we can see here, like this bad build, the orange line, got rolled out to about 20% of our servers, and then we rolled it back. So the thing wasn't so bad. So we've gone from a really vague report of like, hey, the cat picture didn't upload, to an idea of what the, what the problem was, how to fix it, and we know what the impact was. A few more questions you might ask, like which customers were affected? It's nice to know percentage, but if you can actually find the exact people, you can track them down and you know, reach out and say, hey, we had a problem, sorry about that. Uh, maybe more generally, just like which of our customers are seeing the most errors? Is there some poor customer who's like, can never use the app because it's always broken for them? Or even like root cause analysis, like which thing caused this error in the first place? Maybe it was a call to another service. So these are the kinds of questions that Honeycomb trying to, is trying to help you answer. Cool, so how do we do that? How can we answer these sorts of questions? Well, we pretty much need to be able to store the data that you're sending us, and they give it back to you. Well, spoiler alert, how we do that is Retriever. What does a data store look like that can process this kind of workload? Well, for a start, we have a sort of SQL-like query model. We have you know, operations like breakdown and filter, and the idea is you can break down and filter by any property of the data. Uh, you don't have to predefine, like, oh, I'm going to be able to break down by host name or by endpoint, but that's it. You can break down by anything. You know, I did a breakdown by build ID. I, there's lots of things I could do. And you can do these breakdowns even if the fields have high cardinality, which is something that uh, some sort of traditional time series products kind of struggle with. So what the hell does that mean? Well, you know, build ID is one example where if your software has been being developed for a while, you might have hundreds of different builds. Uh, a more interesting example, breakdown by user ID, right? The, that example I gave of um, show me how many users were affected by this error or uh, show me which users are seeing the most errors, that means you need to be able to break down by a field where there might be a million values. You might have a million user IDs. So we need our queries to be able to return raw events, just give you the events back. And that's so you can do that fine-grained analysis. And we also need to be able to return time series because graphs are really helpful for spotting patterns. And we need to do, to create those time series, we need sort of operationally interesting calculations, the kind of things that are useful for solving operational problems, like tell me the 95th percentile of this thing that was going on, uh, you know, 95th percentile response time, or uh, count distinct. It's pretty useful. That's how I did that, um, how far is this build rolled out kind of graph. And we have to do all of that really fast. To go through that example that I just gave you, you know, trying one theory and then plotting a graph and then finding that wasn't the right theory and digging around for more clues and trying a different theory and eventually finding the answer, 
if it took me a minute to run each query, then I'd never get to the end of that process. I'd lose interest and might go make coffee or something. So we need the queries to come back really quickly. And finally, we're a startup. We have a really limited budget and a very small team, which means that this has to be really simple. It can't look like this thing. Um, we aren't building a general purpose database. We don't need to do most of the things that a database needs to do. We have very specific access patterns, both for the data coming in and for the kinds of queries you can run. In fact, we control the only UI that can run queries on this thing. So we know exactly what kinds of queries you can run. Um, and that lets us optimize for very specific access patterns rather than trying to be general purpose. We don't need to be able to update data in place. Once you've sent us an event, it happened. You're not going to go back and say, well, I didn't actually run that HTTP request. Uh, and we don't need to do some of the fancier features that a real database would have, like joins or transactional semantics. So if we can make it simple, we need it to be. Cool. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to describe Retriever. I will start off by sort of giving an overview of what it looks like, uh, how it's designed. Then I'll dive into the details of how we store the events and how we get them back. Uh, some of the interesting details of how we can speed up queries by distributing them. And finally, uh, finish off by talking about some of the cool operational properties that we get, because this is we're actually running our own copy of this, uh, which means we have to be able to do certain kinds of deal with backups and uh, failover and that sort of thing. OK, so let's start off with a very high-level description of what the hell this thing is. So it turns out that someone already solved this problem. So Facebook built a system called Scuba. And this is their internal tool for solving exactly these sorts of problems. Scuba is a distributed event store, meaning that you send them huge numbers of events from lots of different systems at once, and they ingest them and store them all. And they spread them out across many nodes. I think they have some huge number of nodes in, in Facebook. And they make sure that queries are fast by taking the queries and fanning them out also across the nodes to where the data is. And then they make things even faster by storing all the data just in RAM. RAM is really fast. So Scuba is awesome. Uh, if you talk to anyone at Facebook who's used it, they'll pretty much universally agree that they can't go back to a world that doesn't have Scuba in it because it's just so good at answering questions. But it's a Facebook internal tool, which means we can't use it, which means our customers can't use it. So we had to do something different. So Retriever is a distributed event store inspired by Scuba. But we do things a little bit differently. And one of the big things we do differently is that we store data on disk. And the reason we store data on disk is pretty simple. We're not Facebook, and we don't have the infinite money cheat code. So Scuba stores everything in RAM, but it turns out that SSDs are actually really fast as well, particularly for certain kinds of workloads. And you can get perfectly acceptable performance at much less cost, particularly if you're storing stuff for many customers, which we are. We use a column-oriented storage model, which I'll be talking more about later. Um, in fact, this is a great moment for me to do a quick straw poll. Um, could you put your hand up if you're familiar with column-oriented storage already? Awesome, like 70% of the room. Um, could you also put your hand up, this will come in later, if you are familiar with Kafka? About the same, maybe half the room. And could you keep your hand up if you're using Kafka in production? OK, about 25. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we, we use something called column-oriented storage. Um, the current version of Scuba actually uses this as well, but at the time that they published the paper about it, uh, they were using a more traditional sort of row-oriented model, and I'll come into all of that. Um, putting those two things together actually gives us some pretty useful properties, which, again, I'll describe later. We can lean on the file system for a lot of the semantics that we need from, from the data store. So we don't have to build them ourselves. File systems are like decades old mature technology written by kernel hackers, and I'd much rather trust them than any code that I wrote. Uh, similarly, I'd much rather trust Kafka than any code I wrote, and so we trust Kafka for a lot of stuff. 
Great. So at an enormously high level, here's what Retriever looks like. A customer sends us data. We write the data into Kafka. We have Retriever nodes running as consumers on the Kafka queue. They read off the data as it comes in and store it to disk. Uh, we have them operating in pairs, so we have replication. And we have you know, Kafka is partitioned, so we are storing events across multiple nodes. And then when we need to read it, customer issues a query to our API. Kafka is now out of the picture. Our API talks directly to Retriever. Uh, Retriever processes the query, hands it off to some other nodes if it needs to, and does the read. Well, that's ludicrously high level. So let's zoom in and talk about how exactly we're actually storing this data. Uh, by the way, this building is column-oriented. That's important. I, I did warn you about the bad jokes. I'm sorry. OK, so what is our data model? Um, the basic sort of partitioning of our data model is that our customers have one or more data sets. And that's just our terminology for it's basically like a table in a traditional database. Um, and so you might have a data set for your web logs. You might have another data set for uh, database queries that you processed. So data sets are partitioned meaning we spread out the data across multiple nodes. Um, and each data set gets a number of partitions. So most data sets that we are running have three partitions. Uh, some of them, the, the largest ones, have up to 39 in our current system. And data set, data set partitions contain events. What's an event? Well, again, it's just a JSON blob, pretty much. Uh, here's an example of a couple of events. And you can see these two look pretty similar, except one of them's got an extra field. So let's switch to a sort of table-based view for reasons that will become apparent. Uh, so here's, here's showing a number of events you might have sent into our system. And so you'll notice that the schema is pretty uneven here. But effectively, every column in this table is nullable. So some events have an error, some don't. Um, most of them have a path, but we've almost got two different types of event in here. We've got these request-looking events with more structured data in there, and then we've got this one at the end which just has a string message. And as well as not having a fixed schema, this thing could have a huge number of columns. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to have events with 200 columns in. Uh, and that's sort of because you have this schemaless property. You might send us... Well, first of all, you might, you might be tracking a lot of information about even your HTTP requests. You might want to know, how much time did I spend processing this? That's response time. How much time did my database spend processing this versus my view layer versus other things? You might want to track some application-specific things like which user was I performing this request on behalf of uh, or how many results did I get back from the database? And the more you can pack in, the more useful queries you can run. So, Imagine this table potentially being very, very wide. And there's a couple of interesting features here. So on the left, we have this column called index. And the idea is that each event gets assigned a unique index when we see it. And we also have a field called timestamp, which is just when did the event happen. Uh, and every event is required to have a timestamp, and that comes in useful later. So when we're storing these, we have a couple of choices. Uh, and I can, a lot of this is going to be sort of recap for those of you who are familiar with column-oriented storage already. But I think it's worth talking through an example of how it works, because it really brings home the properties that we get out of, out of doing things this way. So we have to turn these things into a stream of bytes one way or another. So we can either store, we can either store an event at a time or a row at a time, or we can do this other thing called column-oriented. So a traditional row-oriented approach, you just store all the fields for a given record together. So you get one record coming in, and you write you know, the path and the response time and the status, and then nothing, because there was no error. Then another record comes in, and you store all the fields. Another record comes in, you store all the fields, and so on. So the whole data set is effectively one long file. You might choose to chunk it into multiple files for other reasons, but that's the basic idea. And this is good for a lot of things. Uh, it's good especially if you're mostly reading all of the data all of the time. 
But it does mean that if all you're interested in is like the response times, you have to skip over a lot of data that you don't really care about. So another way we can do this is by storing a column at a time. And so this is how Retriever does it. We have a file for every column, or column in the table, or a file for every field in the events that you send in. So how would we store the same data in this format? Well, so here's a path file. This path file contains all of the values for the path column. So we get an event in, we record its path. In fact, we record its index and then its path. We get another event, we store the index and the path, another event, index path, etc. So this is the whole path file. And it doesn't mention any other properties. Same idea for response time, we store all the response times. So what about the error file? Because this is a column where we're missing values. Well, we get the first event in, it doesn't have an error, so we don't need to write anything. And I'm not saying we write an empty value, you know, a null or a zero. We just don't write anything at all. We don't even create a file. And then the next event comes in, we need to write something. Third event comes in, again, we can just leave that file untouched. So imagine we had 100 events, and only one of them had an error. We only wrote one thing to this file which means if you're reading errors, if you're interested in counting how many things had an error, for example, again, you can skip over reading a lot of nulls. And I talked about the special timestamp column. The reason this is useful is that because it's always there, we can use this as our index that says what, what events exist in this data set, uh, because the index is the unique value that got assigned to every event. And so we, we need this to know what events do I even have available to query? So that was, that's sort of the general idea, but to make it a bit more concrete, how do we read this data? Well, the first thing we need to do is, we, you know, we've got a query, but we have all these columns. How do, we, how do we know what columns we have available to query? Well, because these are stored as files, they're just files sitting in a directory on disk, we can just say, tell me what files exist. This is something that file systems are pretty good at. We don't actually use ls, but effectively we just say, show me all the files, and this tells us we have all these. So let's say we're running, running the query, give me the average response time for events that had status 200. So we check the files, we know we have these columns, we look at the query, and we say, what columns do we actually care about for this query? We need the index column, because we always need the index to know what events there are. And we're going to need the status column, because that's what we're filtering on. And we're going to need the response time column, because that's what we're calculating. Cool. So we open all those files. And imagine this star is like a file pointer. So we read an index from the index file. OK, we've got index 0. So now we're processing the event with index 0. Now we need to match our filter, so we read a value from the status file until we hit the index that we got, the, the index that we're looking for. In this case, it's index zero, and that's the first thing we read, so great. Now we check the filter, does it match? Well, yes, it does. So now we can read a value from the response time column that we're actually trying to calculate on. We read until we hit zero, here we go. Collect that value, we'll save it off somewhere that we can do the calculation on it later. And we start again, read an index, read a status file until we hit index one, check the filter. Well, this one doesn't match, so we're just gonna skip over this event. So we don't need to read the response time here. So we just go straight back to step one, read an index, index two, read a status file, check the filter, it matches. We're gonna read from the response time file, but this time we get the wrong value. We got the response time for index one, which we skipped just now. So we just keep going until we hit index two. Great, we got it, collect the value, and now we're done. So that's how we read three events, very exciting. But let's look at what we didn't do. So jumping back to the table view, and I've bolded all of the data that we read, which means the stuff that isn't in bold, we didn't read. In fact, we didn't even touch it. We did not open the path file at all. We did not open the error file. Imagine there were 100 columns. That's 100 columns we didn't read. Uh, that's 99% of the data we didn't need to scan in order to answer this query. 
Oh, and there's this slogan of only read what you need. Another interesting thing we can do at uh, read time uh, that's pretty useful for our analytic use case is we do something called dynamic sampling. And this is something that's in the Facebook paper as well. So the interesting thing is that you're sending us all this data and we're storing it all. And that's how we get this flexibility. But it can be pretty expensive to just store everything. And not all of the events that you send us are equally interesting. In particular, most of the happy path looks pretty similar. If, you're, if a request happened, you know, it processed successfully and it processed pretty quickly, you don't care that much about it except to know that it's happening a lot. But you really do care about the errors and the slow queries and the things that looked weird. So it's kind of wasteful to store these successful events that happen way more often, hopefully. I hope your successful events are happening more often than your unsuccessful ones. It's really wasteful to store them all with the same fidelity as you're storing the sort of difficult cases that you actually want to dig into. So what dynamic sampling means is we add this column to the data model called sample rate. And this is another sort of special column. And so when you send us data, you do sampling on your side. So you can say, you know, send us, send 1% of these events. But the dynamic part means rather than just having a flat rule that says send 1% of events, you choose whether to send an event or how frequently to send an event depending on the properties of the event. And that's because if you just do a flat sampling, the problem you have is that the interesting things you want to look into, the low probability events, are more likely to get dropped by the sampling than the common ones. And so you've sort of shot yourself in the foot. But if instead you can look at the event you're about to send and say, this event looked pretty good, so I'm just going to send 1% of these. But you know, so that's the first row in the table. We've got a 200 response and a pretty fast response time. So this event was good. We'll just send 1% of these events. The next one was an error. We'll just send every single error. And then the next event was successful, but it took kind of a long time, you know, 600 milliseconds instead of 150. So maybe if we go above some response time threshold, then we'll sample, but maybe not as heavily as we're sampling the, the good events. And you tell us the sample rate. So you tell us that decision that you made. And what you're really saying there is this event that I'm sending represents 100 other events that are like it. And what that gives us is the ability to do calculations on the sample data. So we only store the sampled stuff, but we can still calculate things like how many events do we get for each status. So like if we're calculating that, we see that for status 200, we had an event come in with sample rate 100, another one with 20, so we had 120 of those. And one event at sample rate 1 with an error. And so even though we've only stored three events, we've actually got the statistics for 120. OK, that's how we read data from a single node. But I said that we speed things up by fanning out queries. So let's talk about that. So a distributed query, the idea is that a client will pick a retriever node to query. The client knows which data set it's querying. And each data set is assigned to certain partitions. So the client will just pick one of those nodes that is consuming on that, that partition and send the query. So we don't have like a static structure of which nodes are, are roots. We just pick one. And then the root says, OK, I know that I'm not the only node serving this query. So I'd better fan out the query to the other nodes on the same partition. Then every node is going to scan the rows that it has in parallel and perform calculations on the subset of the data that it has, and then return the calculations back to the root so it can do a merge of all that data and send the query result back. Well, to make that actually work, we have to tackle the problem that the data is partitioned, which means each node only has part of the answer. And that means we need to be a bit careful when we're doing that combination step. So there are a lot of calculations where if you take two, the result of two partial calculations and then do the calculation again, you don't get the right answer. One simple example being, let's say you're computing the average of these four numbers. The correct answer is two and a quarter. 
But if instead you had split these numbers into you know, one, two, and three, and then three, well, the average of three is three, the average of one, two, and three is two, the average of those two things is two and a half, which is wrong. So we can't compute a partial average. We can't have the, root, the, the leaf nodes compute averages. Instead, we have them compute sums and counts. So they just sum all the values they have and count the number of things they've processed. And then they send both the sum and the count back to the root. And sums and counts can be combined in that way. This is basically commutativity. This is a kind of thing that comes up a lot in a lot of distributed systems topics, like if you've played with CRDTs, they require the same property. And so some other examples besides average are if we're computing things in groups, well, our, the way we store groups is basically just uh, you know, an in-memory hash of the group value to the calculation that you're calculating. And you can merge these things just by looking at all the keys in the group and then merging the values. Uh, we can do this with you know, count distinct, find me the unique values in this set. Uh, to do that in an exact way would be very memory intensive. So instead, we use a data structure called hyperloglog, which lets us compute a probabilistic answer to how many unique values are there in this data set. And it turns out that hyperloglog can be serialized in a way that can be merged in a commutative way. Uh, similarly, for percentiles, there's a similar trick called t-digest. And so we can do all these calculations in a way that we can fan out most of the computation and then just merge it together at the end. One other thing we have to deal with is we still have a root node that's taking all of this data and merging them together. And so in some cases, this is going to be pretty memory intensive. For example, if we were computing a lot of groups, you know, we could have a million groups coming back from each node. And we don't want the root node to fall over because it's processing so much more data than everyone else. So we can do the distribution trick again and do a sort of n-level fan out. Uh, again, this is something that Scuba does. They experimented a bit and found a, a good factor for how many nodes they should allow fanning out to before they split into another level of the tree. If they find that value is five. We use the same value. So OK, we can store data, and we can query it. Great, we're done. Ship it. Except that's not really all there is to say, because we also need this thing to like work reliably. Uh, we need to make money from this thing. So how do we deal with that? So I need to take a quick detour through Kafka. And I'm sure I, I know about half the room is familiar with this already, so I'll try and skim through this. But I want to touch on some of the properties that we use of Kafka in order to get some of the semantics that we need. So we rely pretty heavily on Kafka. For a start, as I showed in that architect diagram, archi yeah, architecture diagram a while ago, uh, it's how we get data in. And that's pretty nice, because we didn't have to write a high volume data ingest pipeline. We just like pu pulled one off the shelf. Um, and Kafka also gives us the ability to distribute writes, to get replicated data, and a couple of other cool things. So what is Kafka? Well, as many of you know, it's a distributed log. It's not exactly a message queue. It's more like it takes data that's coming in and just stores it on disk in a write, in a append-only fashion. The data model is that Kafka has topics, which are a bit like tables again. You publish messages into topics, and those topics are partitioned. Uh, again, partitioning is the way that Kafka gets horizontal scalability. And within a partition, a, a, a property that we rely on is that messages are totally ordered. They come out in the same order that they went in. And again, Kafka actually stores the data on disk. And this is really useful because we can replay if we think we missed data. Uh, this is not unlike a sort of standard message queue where often it's just going to route a message straight from the publisher to the consumer and maybe buffer stuff if there's no consumer available. Kafka just always stores stuff on disk. And so any number of consumers can come along and say, hey, just get me all the events since, uh, since three hours ago. So what does all that mean? Well, we get data in by publishing events to a Kafka topic. We have, as I said, data sets are assigned to partitions. 
those are the same partitions as the Kafka topic is split into. So the client is gonna pick which partition it's writing to. Again, it knows which partitions that data set is supposed to live on. And right now we just partition at random. So the client picks one of the partitions, writes the event to that partition. Random partitioning gives us a nice even split of the data. Uh, it publishes it to Kafka. We have a retriever on that partition consuming from Kafka and writing to disk. And in fact, we have two retrievers on every partition, and that just gives us replication for free. Now every retriever, or every, every partition has two retrievers consuming the same data. Because we trust Kafka's guarantee that uh, messages are totally ordered within a partition, we can be pretty sure that we're getting the same data in the same order, not necessarily at the same time, but you know, eventual consistency. So one of the problems that we need to solve is we don't actually want to store all data forever. We are a business that makes money. We charge customers for storage. So when a customer has exceeded their quota, we need to be able to age out the older data that they sent us. And so what we do for this is that as we're writing data, we split it up into segments. Segments are effectively time slices of the data stream coming in. Uh, and so, in fact, when I said that we assign a unique index to every event, in fact, we do that per segment. So indices are unique within a segment. So we, we represent segments just by directories on disk because we're, right, we're just writing data into files, so we can just split things up by having different directories. File systems already have hierarchy built in. When we've written enough events, we decide, okay, this segment's big enough, it's time for a new one. We just create a new directory and start writing into the new directory instead of the old one. Now the old one, because data is immutable, the old one we can just do what we like to, we can forget about it. Okay, so if we wanna age out some data, well, we can just scan all the directories that exist. Again, just ask the file system what directories there are. We can ask the file system how much space each one takes up. And then we just have a background job running. You know, it's literally just a cron job that says, find me the oldest data that figure out how many of these things I need to delete in order to bring the customer back under quota. And then it just asks the file system to delete the data. So there's all this data management that we don't have to implement ourselves. What about tolerating faults? So sometimes this process is gonna go down. Unfortunately, nothing is perfect. Uh, sometimes we might deploy a bug. Sometimes we might hit some weird case that makes us crash. We might have a network outage. We might just be straight up deploying because we're actively maintaining this. We need to roll out changes to it. Well, we have two replicas of each partition. So we have a copy of the data. So that's great, right? We don't need to fix anything. Well. That's fine for queries. We know we always have a replica available for querying. But it's not quite good enough because we still have new data coming in all the time. And if we've shut down one of our consumers, well, it's not processing events while it's down, obviously. So to recover from failures, where I'm including a deploy as a kind of failure, to recover from that, each retriever is gonna track the offset that it's reached in Kafka. This is pretty standard for any Kafka consumer. And because Kafka is guaranteeing that events are totally ordered, when we start up Retriever, we can just say, get me all the events since the last one that I saw. We trust the ordering, so, so long as that value written down is correct, we can start up from where we left off, reconsume everything, we know we're not consuming duplicates. So, we'll take the incomplete copy that we had and catch up, and now we're back up to normal. But there's a few more things we need to do. And that's because, yeah, right. So every now and then, we're gonna say that we checkpointed the data. And the reason for this is, we're writing data to multiple files. That's the idea of the column-oriented storage model. So, we might be doing a bunch of writes and then the process might die and it might die in between writing, for example, the path value into the path file and before it got a chance to write the response time value into the response time file. 
Well, that's a problem because we've now written half an event. We, don't, we haven't fully written that event to disk, but we might have already written the index file which says that event exists. And because we're treating these files as append only, we've sort of got a problem where we're now inconsistent. In particular, we might be inconsistent between the two replicas. So every now and then we checkpoint. We say, up to this point, up to this event, I am confident that I've written everything fully. And so we store, for each checkpoint, we store the Kafka offset, the point in, in, in the Kafka stream at which that event came in. And we also store our own index. That's the incrementing value that we assigned within a segment to each event. So the offset tells us to re where we can reconsume from. But we can also use that index value to say, this is the latest event that I believe has been fully written. So when we start up, we might get the event coming in from Kafka and say, OK, well, this event is actually, uh, hang on. Right, let's, let's check all of the files that we've already written and say, this file you know, only goes up to the event that we expected, and that's fine. But this file has extra data in it. You know, we wrote some extra values with an index higher than the checkpointed index. In other words, we got ahead of ourselves in those files. So when we start up, as well as reconsuming from Kafka, we also just take all the files we've written and truncate them to the last known good index. And what we're doing there is we're saying, we can't be sure exactly what happened with those files. Some of them are ahead, some of them aren't. It's hard for us to tell afterwards. So instead, let's just treat all of that data past this known good index as suspect and just forget about it and then reconsume from that point. So we're not reprocessing any data that we've written because we've just dropped off all of that data. And that means, that means now we can, recon we can restart retriever at any time, even if it was in the middle of a write, and we know that it's going to pick up from where it left off and not be double counting events if it happens to go back too far. So that's almost good enough. We can handle uh, process failures, but sometimes, you know, just stuff happens in AWS. Sometimes a node can just go away completely. And that's where we're storing the data. We're storing the data on disks on the node, so we do need to handle that case. Well, if we need to bring up a new node to replace it, we can find another node on the same partition because we have two replicas and copy the data over from the, the existing node onto the new one that we're bringing up. And again, because these are just files in directories on disk, we literally just use rsync to do the copy. Uh, rsync is pretty good at comparing two directory trees and figuring out what's missing and copying them across in an efficient way. And cool, now we have a copy of the data that was on the other node. But we might be out of date because we still haven't started consuming. But the good news is when we copied over the data, we also copied over the checkpoint file. So that tells us where to start again from in the Kafka queue. So we, we are sync over to get a snapshot. Then we start consuming Kafka from that point. And now again, we're up to date. And now we have two healthy replicas again. So we get all of these nice operational properties that we need to rely on without having written very much code. We have replication and fault tolerance via Kafka. We have quota management just by file system operations. And we can bring up new nodes, again, using leaning pretty heavily on Kafka and rsync. So that's Retriever. That's as simple a database as we could write. Sorry, data store. Don't write a database. That gives us the primitives we need to run it in production, but keeps things simple. And the things I'd like you to remember from this talk, well, for a start, column-oriented storage, as you already know, is pretty cool. You, can, you only read what you need. It can be a very compact way of storing some kinds of data, and you can get very efficient performance for some kinds of workload. If you need to solve distributed systems problems, Consider not solving them, but instead just using Kafka to solve them for you. If you need to solve data management problems, consider not solving them. File systems are pretty great. Uh, they have atomic operations. They have really intelligent caching. Uh, they have nice synchronization operations. 
But that's all a, another way of saying, sometimes it's okay to solve hard problems, but don't do that until you've looked really hard for ways to make them easy. And I'll be uh, around for questions, and I think there'll be uh, an office hours section in uh, after the coffee break as well. I think we can do one question, and then we should uh, go to coffee break. Hi. Uh, in one of the examples, you had a version in the event, and there was an integer. You said don't have updates. So let's say that right now my application is using like one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so let's say okay, now I want like same version, same versioning, semantic versioning, like one dot two dot three. Now how do I go back or make it this valid? I'm uh, I'm not sure I understood that we had a version in the event. One of the examples you had, there was like path, build ID, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. So let's say that build ID is my application version. And let's say that's an mm -hmm. integer today. But tomorrow, it's not an integer anymore. Oh, I see. So you're asking um, what happens if the type of a field changes. Exactly. Right. So one of the nice things about making so few assumptions as we make is that we can sort of handle fields changing type. Uh, we can. You know, you, at one point you're writing the version as an integer, and we'll write it to file. We'll write it to disk as an integer file. But if you start sending us strings, well, we can detect that and say, okay, we'll just store two files. So everything you sent us as an integer will stay that way. Everything you sent us as a string will create a new file alongside it. Then at read time, we can open both files and do the appropriate merge, uh, and all of that. That's kind of messy, but that only lasts for as long as a segment does, because as soon as we roll the segment over, hopefully you're, you're now writing only strings, and then uh, you know, we're in a, a nice stringy world from there on. And we can, we can do coercion at read time. So you know, if you give us a query that doesn't make sense for your old type, or like the new, let's say you, what you, for some reason you were asking us the average version, well, that'll stop working as soon as you start sending us strings. But we can always coerce a string to a number. I think we just, you know, make it equal to zero or something. So it's not going to blow us up. You're just you're going to get as as meaningful an answer as the data you sent in. 